Given the amount of conversation going on, it sounds like y'all like each other. That's positive. Do me a favor, look at the person next to you that you never talked to and say, it's great that you're here. This is something really special and important that we do when we're together and we're here for the sole purpose of the worship of God. Um, It's important, it's special to come here every week and do that. And it's biblical, right? Because there is nothing in the Bible about a lone ranger Christianity. Uh, We're in this thing together. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we'll pick it up at verse 5, and if you're reading a pew Bible, it'll be page 1162. Philippians, right after Ephesians, just before Colossians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. When you find that passage, please stand with us in honor of God's word. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being a very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross." Therefore God highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May God bless his word among us. Please be seated. I will admit in all of the scriptures, this is my very favorite passage. It is here that Paul sort of pulls back the veil of eternity, as it were, and allows us to cast our gaze upon the character of Christ, both before Bethlehem and after. And that's why this passage is is unique. Um, And for that reason, it's the best time of year to look at a text like this, right? Because um, this is the year that we look forward to the incarnation, and uh, in the same way, look forward to the second advent when Christ will make all things right. The context of our text is Paul's argument in an attempt to establish unity in the Philippian church. He says in verse 2, Have the same mind, have the same love, be in full accord and of one mind. Paul is eager to see the church unified because a divided church is irrelevant and usually useless. If we're infighting, we're not going to pay mind to the orphan and the widow And in our context, the half a dozen addicted people that walk through our parking lot every day. The kind of unity, though, that Paul is seeking to establish is not rooted in the superficial stuff of the world. Our unity together isn't rooted in the fact that we come from the same part of the world or that we have similar experiences. Rather, our unity is rooted in God's truth. Our unity is rooted in our good theology. And so I can come here and I can talk to my brother and sister in Christ who are from a completely different part of the world, and it's like talking to family. Why? Because we hold the same truths to be precious and holy. The means by which Paul seeks to establish this unity, if you look in verses 3 and 4, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Paul then, in verse 5, points us to Christ and uses Christ as an object lesson. And verses 6 through 11, interestingly, have been understood by Christian scholars to be a piece of a primitive hymn. Paul's taken a fragment of this hymn from the early church, and he's used it for his own argument. And we've seen that before in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Pastor Mike Uh, preached on that passage where Jesus was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, and so forth. That also has all of the hallmarks of an early Christian hymn. 
What is really interesting, though, is the title given for this hymn traditionally. Verses 6 through 11 traditionally have been known as the hymn to Christ as God. The hymn to Christ as God. That is absolutely amazing, and you're probably wondering why, right? Uh, it'll take me a little bit to explain, but, but bear with me. I think, it'll, I think it'll pay off in the end. Why is this called the hymn to Christ as God, and why is that important? You know that the early church was relentlessly persecuted by the Romans. We were, our spiritual ancestors anyway, were gathered into the Colosseums. We were fed to the lions for sport. Nero dipped us in oil and used us as human torches in his gardens. Christians were killed all the day long in Rome. It was like a, uh, a hobby. But why, why did the Romans treat us that way? Why do they seek our persecution? And what history tells us is that the Roman society had a com- bunch of complete misconceptions about who Christians were and what we believed. I'm going to give you three examples of those misconceptions that sort of fueled their persecution. Number one, the Romans believed that Christians were cannibals. Uh, this is based on a misunderstanding of what we mean with the Lord's Supper. We symbolically drink the blood of Christ and eat his flesh. Not really, but symbolically. And the Romans misunderstood that, and rumor developed that we were cannibals. A second example of why, of a misconception uh, uh, that the Romans had. They believed that Christians were incestuous. And that probably sounds very bizarre, but if you think about it, the early church, if you, if you were in the early church, you would constantly call your wife sister, and she would call you brother. That was a hallmark of uh, the way the early church behaved, and the Romans misunderstood that relationship. Number three, they called us atheists, which probably sounds a little absurd, especially since we just refuted atheism in Sunday school. Because the Christians didn't worship the Roman pantheon of gods, of which Caesar was a member, the Romans believed Caesar was a god. Because we didn't do that, because we wouldn't take the pinch of incense and throw it in a fire as an offering, because we wouldn't say, Kaiser Kyrios, Caesar is Lord, but instead we would say, Jesus esting Kyrios, Jesus is Lord. They called us atheists. When they told our ancestors to worship their gods, they said, There is no God but one and no king but Christ. And they persecuted us for that. There was a a Roman official by the name of Pliny. He was governor of Pontus. And you hear about Pontus in the New Testament. Pliny wrote to the emperor. We still have his letter. He wrote to the emperor uh, by the name of Trajan about Christians. And in his correspondence, he talked about how he would give Christians three chances to recant their faith. And on the third try, when they wouldn't, he would have them executed. And in his letter, he even notes that it's not because they committed any crime. There was no crime that they committed except being a Christian. And so he would execute them because he said, quote, they were depraved. And you've got to know that the earliest Christians weren't from the Roman aristocracy. We weren't made of nobles, but rather prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners and drunks, the peasantry, the fishermen. That's who made up the early church. And Pliny, in his letter to Trajan, he said that he investigated these Christians before he would have them executed to see exactly what they were up to. I'm going to read you a little bit of a a quote of what Pliny said about these Christians. Quote, They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn, and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as God. A hymn to Christ as God. We don't know with 100% certainty that what Pliny was talking about was in fact Philippians 2, 6 through 11. But I, wouldn't, uh, I don't think I'd put it past God to do that. And I think that's rather remarkable. And so uh, let's take a look at our text and dig in. Paul begins uh, this passage with something of an object lesson, right? He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This mind, or you might say attitude, is ours in Christ in the sense that we're looking at Christ. We're examining Him and using Him as our example. But in another sense, this attitude is ours in Christ in that we as Christians are being conformed day by day to the image of the Son of God. 
Each day as we live, the Holy Spirit is making us more like Jesus. So when we hit glory, uh, we'll have the very character of Christ. Uh, and we won't have uh, the hitch of sin anymore. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does Paul mean by he was in the form of God? And the NIV says he was in very nature God, and that's a less than literal translation. It literally says the morphe theou, the form of God. Why didn't Paul just come out and say, he's God? Why did he say the form of God? Well, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's employing a turn of speech that is intended to distinguish the Son from the Father, but at the same time, he's trying to show us that the Son is exactly like his Father, that Jesus has all of the attributes and accoutrements belonging to deity. In fact, Jesus is so much like his Father that if he were here now and we were at his feet, it would be foolish for us to say to Jesus, show us the Father, because he's exactly like the Father. And if you remember, something like that happened in the Bible. In John chapter 14, Jesus was with the disciples, and Philip said to him, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. It sounds pious, doesn't it? Show us the Father, Lord. And what did Jesus say to Philip? Have I not been so long with you, Philip, and you still don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. Not because the Son is the Father, but because he's exactly like the Father. And many Christians don't know that that Jesus is just as much God as the Father. Jesus is the creator of all things. He literally spoke creation into existence. Paul wrote to the Colossians, For by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the the fulfillment, the purpose of creation, and that means every single thing, every molecule has a purpose in the economy of Christ. Even wicked people, even the the evil has a purpose in in Christ. Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. The Son was in the form of God, yet he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is a, an interesting way to put it. He did not think equality with God something to be cleaved onto. In other words, he had equality with God, but he didn't hold on to it like a prize, like Gollum in the Lord of the Rings held on to that ring. He wouldn't let it go. Jesus didn't do that with his equality with God. But rather, the text says, he made himself nothing. Uh, here, Paul uses the verb kenao, uh, literally means to empty. He emptied himself. The son didn't cleave to his equality with God, but instead he emptied himself. I like how the King James puts it. He thought it not robbery to think himself equal with God, but rather he emptied himself. And if you read them, liberals and cultists will argue that what is being said here is that Jesus literally emptied himself of his deity so that when he became man, he was no longer God. And we'll see in a moment that um, this kind of interpretation doesn't play out with the grammar of the text. Uh, But what it requires is that God changed. That Jesus was God before the Incarnation, and then after Bethlehem, Jesus wasn't God. That God was a trinity before and a binity after. Um, But we know that God doesn't change, right? I mean, God would have no need to change. He's perfect in every conceivable way. Uh, For instance, Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. The basis of our assurance for salvation isn't our changelessness, it's not our faithfulness, but rather the faithfulness of Christ and the faithfulness and unchangeability of God, because we have a Savior who is the same yesterday and today and forever, and therefore we can trust that our salvation is secure only because of Him. Paul says, He emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. The means by which that Jesus emptied himself is a little bit counterintuitive. He emptied himself by taking something on himself. He emptied himself by taking upon himself all of the limitations of human existence so that now Jesus is exactly like you. His humanity is just as authentic as yours, genuine in every way. This was the one who was in the form of God, enjoying all of the peace and majesty that belongs only to God, 
And then he entered into his own creation, invading his own creation to be born in a stable, a filthy barn. And don't miss these pronouns. Look at what it says in verse 7. He emptied himself. And you see it again in verse 9. He humbled himself. Those reflexive, reflexive pronouns tell us that this wasn't something that was forced upon Jesus. Nobody made Jesus empty himself to be born in the stable. Nobody made Jesus humble himself to death, but rather this is something that he did of his own volition. He did it because he wanted to do it. He wanted to empty himself and come into his own creation to redeem you and I. And this reminds me of of something that Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Have you ever wondered why, why Jesus didn't just come as an adult and go to the cross and die and get resurrected and ascend? Why did he go through all the trouble of being born as a fragile baby? Ever wondered that? Jesus came to this earth entered into his own creation not merely to pay for your sins. He didn't just come to pay the penalty for your sins. That's an important part of why he came, but that's not it. He came to live a life of utter perfection, to merit for himself a righteousness. You remember Paul says, Jesus was born of woman, born under the law. That idea of being born under the law, it's something of an idiom that means you're accountable to every point of the law. That was Jesus' life, being born under the law. The text says, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. On that cross, something happened. Something that you couldn't see by watching Jesus die, but... But it happened, and the Bible talks about it. Luther called it the great exchange. On that cross, Jesus received your sin. All of it. Every single sin. And Jesus drank the full cup of God's wrath down to the dregs so that God no longer had a wrath for you. He took the wrath that you and I kindled for ourselves, and he satisfied it. But in place of your sins, you're not, you're not in Christ. You're not like back where Adam was before the fall, like sort of morally neutral. You've been given a righteousness. That righteous life that Jesus lived from Bethlehem onward to the cross is now yours. So when God looks at you, he sees you with the perfect righteousness of Christ. It's called the imputation of righteousness, and it's ours for the taking What people don't understand these days, especially Christians, is that Christmas is about the cross. It's about a cross that our Savior died on. That is why we put a tree in our house, because our Savior died on the tree. And we make it an evergreen tree because He gave us everlasting life. And we wrap that tree in lights because He is the light of the world. And we put a star on the tree because it was a star that heralded the coming of our King. And we put presents under the tree because when he came, he came giving gifts to men. The gifts of righteousness and eternal life. We have to remember that. We have to remember what Christmas is about. The earlier church knew about Christmas and they loved it. They celebrated it on the 25th just like we do. And you hear, you hear a lot about Christmas, but rarely do you hear anything about how the early church celebrated it. Uh, for example, everyone around Christmas talks about Santa Claus, right? I mean, it's ubiquitous. You turn on the radio, they're singing about Santa Claus. You drive down the street, there he is in somebody's front yard. One of those big blow-up monstrosities that people put in their front yard. Sorry if you got one of those, but it's true. Uh, what most Christians don't know is that St. Nick was a historical person, right? He was a real person, Santa Claus. Um, and he w- was a believer. He loved Jesus And St. Nick defended the notion that Jesus came into this creation, God come in human flesh. Uh, He was a great defender of the deity of Christ and of the doctrine of the Trinity. 
Um, St. Nick was the bishop of a city named Smyrna. You read about Smyrna in Revelation in various places in the New Testament. Um, he came from uh, a, a rich background. He came from a very wealthy family, and he was a philanthropist. That's, that's historically true. I'd like to give you a little bit of a brief example of the historical Santa Claus, uh, something that happened in his life. When Christianity was legalized in the empire in 321 AD, um, there was something of a controversy going on in the early church. There was a man named Arius who made a habit of teaching that Jesus wasn't the creator, but rather a creation. And so Jesus wasn't eternal. He wasn't always God, but rather he was a God, similar to what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach now. And Arius taught that, um, that Christmas really wasn't important. He didn't celebrate it. He didn't see a reason to it. And the early church had this council in 325 AD called the Council of Nicaea to sort of rectify this issue about Arius' teaching. I'm going to read to you a description of this council and and St. Nick's involvement in there. Quote, The emperor was sitting on his throne. He was flanked by 159 bishops to his left and 159 bishops to his right. Arius was presenting his views with great vigor and detail. As St. Nicholas observed the scene, the bishops listened to Arius in complete silence and without interrupting his discourse. Outraged and prompted by his saintly vigor, he left his seat, walked up to Arius, faced him squarely, and slapped his face. St. Nick loved Christmas. He loved what it represents. And he loved that Christ was obedient even unto death. Our text says that God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. Within the text, there's a little bit of an ambiguity. Is the name that is above every name Lord? Or is the name that is above every name Jesus? I listen to the arguments. I think it's Jesus. There's a sweetness about the name of Jesus. Maybe I'm conditioned to think that, but I, when I hear that name Jesus, my heart sings. My heart sings for this God who, who came into his own creation and walked the dust of this earth and breathed our air. God has highly exalted him. Look, that's not something that's going to happen in the future. Look at the verb. God has highly exalted him. That already happened. Jesus right now has comprehensive dominion over every single thing. We may not look around and it may not seem like it, but he has that dominion. He is in sovereign control of everything. He has the name that is above every name, having secured our salvation. This timeline of Jesus' life from the exalted state of God to the humility of the cross and back to exaltation, right? When Jesus was resurrected, he went back to glory, being seated at the right hand of God, the place of power. That timeline is something that is actually uh, portrayed in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus himself actually portrayed it. If you remember in John chapter 13... There's Jesus with his disciples, and he takes off his outer garment, his cloak, puts it away, and he wraps a towel around his waist, putting on the form of a servant, right, an apron. And then he proceeds to wash the disciples' feet, one by one. And you remember Peter objects, like, you're not washing my feet, Lord, I'm washing your feet. In antiquity, if you were a disciple... You would do everything for your master, but the one thing you wouldn't do is wash your master's feet. That was uh, something for a slave to do. And in fact, that's the word used here. He was in the form of a slave. The word doulos means slave. I don't know why they translate it servant. There's something different between a servant and a slave. Jesus was a slave. He put on the apron. He put on the form of a slave and washed his disciples' feet, cleansing them. And then when his work of cleansing was done, he took off that apron and he put back on his cloak. Symbolic of the fact that when Jesus was resurrected, he received all of his glory back. 
And you read about that in John chapter 17 where Jesus prays, Father, give me the glory that I had with you before the beginning of the world. And that is precisely what Christmas is all about. Christmas is a picture of the coming and work of Christ that God came to us and with human hands saved our souls. That God entered into this creation only to be so obedient that it drove him to the cross. And it's this mindset of humility that Paul has pointed to for us today. This mindset that we ought not to be infighting, but rather uniting under this king so that we can be effective and do the work that God has set before us. I hope you'll think about that this Christmas. And I hope you'll rejoice in the fact that Christmas is a distinctly Christian holiday where the coming of Jesus Christ has been given to us. And for that reason, we look forward to his coming again. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your blessings and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for, uh, for this Savior who was so gracious to, to choose the worst of the worst to save. And so we pray that you would, uh, you would remind us every moment Make us bold with the gospel as we leave this place and and as we receive the Lord's Supper now. Proclaim the gospel to us in our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name.